Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be back in Glasgow. Um, I've, uh, it's been too long. I used to live here for six years and I've been stuck in London for the past few years, so it's good to breath of fresh air. Um, so yeah, so I had a quick check on the website before I started here and uh, said that the, the event is to problem pose the underlying issues behind the allocation of resources and property within the arts and cultural sphere. Um, so I'm really going to be talking a little bit about uh, the kind of the economics behind this and uh, give a bit of a bigger picture context about how it is that we that we got here uh, and hopefully provide a bit of a connection between some of the kind of big picture economic system stuff and make that connection to the the challenges that have been that were that have been faced by places like this market gallery and lots of other places uh, across the country. Um, I'm going to begin with a, a little bit of, of kind of history and context um, about the kind of intellectual roots and political developments that have led to uh, the, the economic system which we kind of live under today, which is dominant, uh, which is often referred to as, as neoliberalism. Um, and I'll then try and give some concrete examples of how this has kind of radically altered uh, society, particularly as it relates to um, kind of common or collective spaces and forms of ownership um, that we have, not just in the arts but in other places in, in society as well. Um, I'm not going to try and be too gloomy, I'm going to try and end on a bit of a positive note because I know that it's quite easy to kind of get gloomy in these, uh, in these times. Um, so yeah, I'm going to kick off some history, so very quickly, I mean this might not be that new to some people, it might be, but I'm just going to kind of gallop through it just to provide some big picture context. Um, it really starts here. So this is, uh, Google tells me, uh, a picture of the Great Depression, uh, which um, obviously started in, in 1929. And the reason I'm starting here was this was kind of a, a major crisis point in, in capitalism, um, where the system that had been in place uh, for the years prior to that kind of fairly laissez-faire kind of model of uh, liberal markets and minimal regulation, minimal state involvement in the economy, um, this really came kind of crashing down quite suddenly with a, a huge, huge uh, hit both in uh, the US and, and Europe and elsewhere, a big downturn with big social costs. Um, and at the time, this kind of led to a lot of soul searching among economists, policymakers, government and other kind of important people of the time um, about, you know, what, what kind of went wrong here and, you know, where do we go from here? Um, and the kind of existing economic theory of the time was really not really able to explain what, what was happening and why, not only why this had happened, but why wasn't the economy picking up? Why wasn't the market sort of adjusting and just getting things going again? Um, and so, yeah, there was a little bit of soul searching among, uh, among the kind of intellectual classes. Um, and then along came uh, this guy here. You might recognize him, a guy called John, John Maynard Keynes. He was a, a British uh, economist. Um, and his most famous book there is The General Theory, published, I think it was 1936. Um, and what Keynes said was, um, seems kind of obvious now, but at the time was kind of uh, revolutionary, was that sort of free markets as such don't have any kind of self-adjusting mechanism that's going to bring the economy back on track. Um, there's no kind of uh, self-balancing mechanism there and, and if you just rely on the kind of chaos of the market you can quite easily end up getting stuck in quite a bad place. Uh, and he said that capitalism really is inherently unstable and that you need government to intervene uh, through policy and regulation and government spending to try and uh, stabilise capitalism but also when it fails to try and make sure you get it back on track again because otherwise you can end up in a huge big depression like, like, like it already happened. Um, and kind of after the, the Second World War in particular, Keynes' ideas became really uh, dominant among uh, Western European and, and even to an extent in the US in terms of policy making. Um, and this was, a, a, this was reflected in policy of the time, and this was in, in Britain at a time where you had bold social reforms after World War II, uh, things like the foundation of the NHS, the welfare state, um, the nationalisation of the railways, um, uh, and, and after, after World War II for the next sort of 20 years, this was a period of really quite impressive improvement in, in living standards. You had uh, massive growth, you had huge gains in productivity, which was a accompanied by uh, significant wage increases, partly because of the, the, the strong collective bargaining and trade union movements of the time as well. Um, 
And this was really sometimes referred to as kind of the golden age of capitalism, this period after the war up until the kind of late 1960s, where, uh, you know, things were going quite well. Capitalism seemed to be delivering the goods to a certain extent. And I think this is kind of reflected uh, how Macmillan, the Prime Minister, said, you know, people have never had it so good. Uh, and to some extent, that was, that was, that was true. Um, not everyone was, was happy about this, though. Um, I promise that not all my slides are going to be of old white men, black and white pictures. Uh, this is just, it's hard to do economic history without showing like old white men in black and white photos, but uh, this will be the last of them. Um, so yeah, not everyone was happy with this kind of consensus, the kind of Keynesian consensus that, that, that was in place uh, after World War II. Uh, and there was a group of kind of quite obscure at the time anyway, uh, economists who really saw this uh, this growing role of the state as a sign of kind of evil collectivism. Um, and they, they almost put it kind of on the same spectrum as a sort of step towards, you know, sort of fascism and communism. Uh, and this was really going in the wrong direction. Um, uh, and we've got here, we've got on the left, you've got Friedrich Hayek, and then in the middle, you've got Ludwig von Mises. So they were both Austrian exiles, um, uh, Hayek to the UK and Mises to the US. And on the right, you've got Milton Friedman, who's a little bit later on. Um, but I'll come back to talk about them uh, in a bit more detail. Um, but these two economists really believed, uh, almost religiously, in the, the kind of virtues of individualism, free markets, private property. Um, uh, and, and they really saw this sort of growing social democratic model as a really a threat to their, their ideals. Um, and between them, they published uh, a number of works, uh, books, which are you know, actually really interesting, interesting to read. Uh, which at the time kind of got a little bit of attention, but they were still kind of really sideshows. They were out, out, out on a whim, not really being taken seriously by, uh, by the mainstream. Um, but they did, however, uh, eventually kind of catch the attention of uh, some pretty well-off uh, people from the business community and industrious, etc., who saw in this kind of philosophy uh, a way to sort of I guess, relieve them of the kind of tax and regulation which was, which was prevalent under the, the Keynesian model after World War II. Um, and it really provided a bit of intellectual cover for that, for that sort of system. Um, and with their help, uh, it's quite fascinating actually, over a number of decades, it's kind of established a bit of a transatlantic network of uh, kind of intellectuals, economists, uh, industrialists. Uh, they kind of formed this, this kind of hub uh, intellectual hub that was all sort of around uh, this new ideology uh, which would, would come to be known or referred to as, as neoliberalism which I'll, I'll come into back to talk about a bit more um, and uh, for most of the time though it was a kind of a, a little elite kind of sideshow club it wasn't really making any real headways in, in, in politics um, but through this there was they did found a number of influential particularly think tanks uh, and in the UK, places like the Institute of Economic Affairs, Adam Smith Institute, Centre for Policy Studies as well, um, were all kind of born out of this, of this movement. Um, still around today and, and still actually quite influential. Um, but it really wasn't until uh, the 1970s when uh, uh, the, the, the kind of post-war consensus model really came to a bit of an abrupt challenge when um, you had economic crisis on both sides of the Atlantic, you had an oil crisis, you had high inflation, low growth, called sometimes referred to as stagflation, um, high unemployment and really quite a lot of discontent in society. There was growing tensions between the unions and industry as well. Um, and I think this, this picture here is the, supposedly from the, the winter of discontent, again, according to, according to Google. Um, and really, this was the kind of uh, the, 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 the economists that I've just talked about and others kind of seized the moment to kind of say, look, this is, this is really the fault of, of the Keynesian model. And it's, it's because there's too much government, trade unions are too powerful. You know, this system just isn't working anymore. It's not delivering the goods. And, and, and we've got the answer, um, um, which was their, as I said, their, their, their model. Um, and there's an interesting quote, actually, from uh, Milton Friedman, who said, uh, when the time came that you had to change, there was an alternative ready there to be picked up. Um, and this was really, say, they'd been developed over, over kind of decades um, through the work of, of these intellectuals, really, uh, and through their network of influential uh, um, uh, 
think tanks made quite a lot of headway with certain political parties and politicians on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and it did start to have some effect under uh, Jimmy Carter's administration in the US and uh, Callaghan's government in Britain. But it wasn't really until uh, we had the election of Margaret Thatcher uh, and Ronald Reagan on the other side of the Atlantic where this is really where uh, the real change sort of starts to happen, which, uh, which you know, I'm sure we're all aware of. Um, and this is where this, this new ideology, again, which sometimes referred to as, as neoliberalism, the, the sort of neoliberal age was kind of born. Um, and when I talk about neoliberalism, I think it's important to kind of describe what it is I mean, because I think that, that term, it's often flung around quite a lot, and I, I almost don't like using it because it's quite jargony. It doesn't mean much to very many people. Um, so I think it is important to maybe just, just focus in a bit about what, what it actually is that I'm talking about. And, and what I mean by that word, at least to me, is it's a specific rules of the game of capitalism. It's a particular way to arrange the rules to play capitalism. So there's very different ways of doing capitalism. Keynesianism is one, and neoliberalism is, is another. Um, I think it's just worth, I'm just going to read out a quote. So this is a quote by a, a, a scholar, David Harvey, where he kind of outlines the basic tenets of neoliberalism. And I think it's just helpful to do this um, so that we all, we're all on the same page. So neoliberalism is a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. The role of the state is to create and preserve an institutional framework appropriate to such practices. The state must set up um, those military, defence, police and legal structures and functions required to secure private property rights and to guarantee by force, if by necessary, the proper functioning of markets. If markets don't exist in areas like water, education, healthcare, social security or environment, then they must be created by state action if necessary. But beyond these tasks, the state should not venture, and state intervention in markets, once they're created, should be kept to a minimum. So I think this is, 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 is quite a helpful outline, because often when people talk about this, is this described as just sort of lazy fair where the government doesn't really do much and they just let markets rip, where I think the important thing with this, uh, with, with the neoliberal model, is actually the state can often play a very assertive role. Uh, but it's a, it's a way of asserting and creating and enforcing this, these new rules of the game and creating these new institutions or creating markets where there previously were none before and using state power to do that. Uh, and we see this through, through things like, you know, quite violently with the sort of crushing of, of the trade unions and, and privatisations, etc. Um, and importantly, and particularly in the case of Margaret Thatcher, she kind of recognised this, the role, the power of, of this economic ideology, that it wasn't just about the economy. This was really about transforming society fundamentally. Uh, and there's a great quote where she said, economics are the method, the object is to change the soul. Um, and that's really what this was about. This was about changing the fundamental way that human relationships in society, a different way of looking at things. Um, uh, and, and as we'll see, she was pretty successful at that. So what does this mean in, in practice then, in, in practical terms? I had a kind of a, a fairly kind of academic uh, definition there, but um, what I've got here is just very, very high level. What does this mean in practice? What was the program, the policy program that, associate, that was associated with this? Um, so firstly, you've got the kind of crushing of the trade unions and the deregulation of labor markets. So under the, the philosophy of people like Hayek and Milton Friedman that I just talked about, any sort of collective <laughs> solidarity was really the kind of enemy here. Um, it was, you know, it was to be a, a society of individuals rather than, than collectives, any sort of collective. And it's kind of summed up by, you know, that famous Thatcher quote, which is, there's no such thing as society. Um, you know, that we're basically a society, we're basically an, a, a group of individuals all operating with our own self-interest. And this idea that, society, that we're a greater than the sum of our parts just isn't, wasn't really a thing. Um, so trade unions were the kind of antithesis of that, and that's why very quickly they were set out to kind of uh, delegitimize trade unions and reduce their, their role in life. Uh, secondly, massive tax cuts, particularly for the, for the rich. Um, there's very much a philosophy of uh, leave particularly wealthy people. Uh, they know how best to use their money, and if we just leave them alone, then somehow the wealth will somehow magically kind of trickle down to the rest of society in some mysterious way. Um, which never really happened, uh, but also kind of reining in welfare for, for the poor. 
um, and, and in the welfare system having some sort of punitive incentives in place to try and sort of discipline, uh, instill kind of market discipline in that part of society. Um, another important one is the kind of re removal of capital controls. So um, again, it might be hard to believe now, but for most of modern history, it wasn't really possible for uh, mega rich people to just sort of move around money willy-nilly anywhere in the world at the drop of a hat uh, or offshore in kind of tax havens. There was pretty strict controls about how you could move capital across borders. Um, uh, but that went out the window very quickly in, in, uh, in, in sort of the early 1980s. Um, and in particular, that went along with the deregulation of finance. Um, and this is something I'll maybe come back to in a bit later, but this was very, very important uh, in, uh, in the development of the course of the next few decades, but fundamentally this was about removing controls on finance that had been put in place for good reason, many of them after the Great Depression, uh, to kind of make sure that finance plays a, a limited role in serving society rather than kind of this sort of uh, casino f speculative way that kind of ends up dominating the rest of society. Um, and uh, most importantly, uh, the kind of what's called rolling the frontiers of the state back through uh, privatisation. Um, so this was about the, the idea that the public sector or, or, or the goods, essential goods and services shouldn't be delivered in a collective way owned by the public. Instead, it's, it should be in private hands, delivered where possible uh, via market exchange. Um, and you had a, a series of quite big privatisations. You had uh, telecoms in 1984, gas 1986, uh, water in 1989 in England and Wales and Scotland. It, it remained in the public sector. Electricity. Uh, railways, and this kind of went through, there was, a, there was a really big burst, but it has been kind of slowly continuing, and then of course we had the, the Royal Mail uh, very recently, a uh, sort of recent example of that. Um, and this was uh, kind of pioneered in, in the UK really, but also to degree in the US, but then uh, exported increasingly to other parts of, of the world. But certainly very few con countries embraced the privatisation of, of key utilities quite enthusiastically as the UK did. Um, really, really, we really, really went for it um, quite heavily. Um, and so just very briefly, uh, uh, just to give a big picture of what were the kind of effects on, on the economy of these, these kind of changes. So one, one very big one was an increase in, in inequality. Um, this chart here just shows the share of total pre-tax income accruing to the, the highest 1% of earners across different countries. Um, and at the bottom there, that was the share in 1981, and at the top, that was the share in 2012. And you can see that the UK uh, has the second biggest increase behind the US, um, which the US is just off the scale. Um, but the UK is still the second highest, but it went from about 7% in 1981 to you know, nearly 14%, so doubled in that time. Um, and this is really the result of things like the big tax cuts uh, on, on high earners, but also things like the erosion of uh, trade union rights and things like that, which can kind of held back the earnings and lower and middle incomes. Um, so this sort of increasing gap between uh, rich and poor. I think one important thing that this doesn't highlight, this is the top 1%, but actually there's even greater inequalities within that 1%. So the, the kind of not... 0.1% is just, you know, the, the, the income that's going to them is, is increased even more dramatically. Um, but I think that's quite striking in, a, in and of itself. And you can see as well that the UK is particularly, has been particularly uh, uh, enthusiastic about this. Obviously not quite the same extent to the US, but certainly compared to a lot of the other countries that we see there. Um, another thing was just the, the kind of the change in the actual uh, makeup of the UK economy. Um, one of the key, uh, the, uh, the key things that under the Thatcher government was really kind of moving away from industry. So there's various, uh, various measures put in place to basically try and uh, shift away Britain's economy from manufacturing or things like mining, etc., and towards more service-based economy, in particular financial services. Um, and what we should see here is just the percentage of GDP by, uh, on manufacturing in the blue and financial services in, in the red. Um, and you can see the declining importance of manufacturing over time and, and finance just uh, increasing rapidly, particularly that's fueled by the deregulation that I was talking about uh, earlier on. And this here then has geographical consequences, uh, particularly in the UK, because the, the manufacturing stuff in the blue tended to be quite distributed around different parts of the UK, so north of England, Wales and Scotland and things like that. 
whereas the red, the finance, was very dominated in London and the South East. One of the consequences of this kind of shifting patterns in the economy has been massive increases in uh, geographic inequality within the UK. Um, so this chart here shows the regional disparities in GDP per capita by every EU country. So GDP per capita is kind of a, a rough proxy for living, living standards. Um, and at the very top of each bar, that's, that's GDP per capita in the wealthiest region or part of the country in that country. And at the bottom, that's the poorest part. And the red dot is the capital. So what you see in the UK is the red dot at the very top, central London, which is just off the chart in terms of wealth. It's in terms of Europe, by far the wealthiest place in Europe. Down the bottom, you have, it's, I think it's uh, the valleys in Wales, which in terms of, living, in terms of standard living is you know, on a par with parts of the more recent countries in the EU and Eastern Europe. Um, so you can see, compared to other parts of Europe, it really is stark, the kind of different uh, in terms of the geographic inequalities within the UK. And I think there's some interesting things to be said about the data here and you know, what's happened in the debate around and, and Brexit and things like that. Nonetheless, I think it is quite stark just to, just to look at. Okay, so um, I hope that that gives a little bit of a, a kind of a big picture context, a kind of a whirlwind tour of what's happened. Um, I want to talk a little bit more just to focus on a particular issue um, as to how the neoliberalism has kind of transformed that, a particular part of our society in a way, and I think it's a particularly good example, and that's housing. Um, and the reason I'm picking housing is not just because it's one of the major issues in the country at the moment, the housing crisis, a uh, huge challenge that affects everyone, um, but really because it crystallises so many of the problems that uh, has, has neoliberalism has given rise to, things like inequality, alienation, intergenerational aspect, the kind of explosion in, in unearned wealth, uh, and the erosion of collective and social solidarity, um, which I think is particularly stark. Um, and the development of housing policy over the past uh, four decades leading to the housing crisis today really bears all the hallmarks of the, the neoliberal approach to the economy, the rules of the game that have been set up in this particular form uh, of capitalism. And it's also something that I understand has had an impact to the degree on the situation that market galleries ended up in. Um, so I think it's just worth, I'm just going to kind of tell a bit of a story as to how this has played out in housing in the UK. Um, so if we just wind back a little bit first, so after the, in the kind of post-war era, uh, government played a very, very important role uh, in the provision of housing. Uh, and this is particularly the case uh, when, when the war ended, the First World War and the Second World War. The government saw it as extremely important to provide a high quality, affordable housing for soldiers that were returning home, partly as to, to kind of keep social cohesion. Uh, but also, interestingly, explicitly acknowledged to kind of stave off the threat of more radical change, particularly after the Russian Revolution uh, in 1917, to kind of stave off the threat of Bolshevism. So let's kind of make sure we can provide a decent standard of living for people uh, and decent housing away from the kind of the real slum conditions which were prevalent at the start of that century. Um, and so housing was really uh, came to play a, a role an important role, mainly as a kind of a universal right, as kind of a good that most people had, had an entitlement to. Um, but with the election of Margaret Thatcher, uh, this really all changed, and the approach to housing changed dramatically. Um, and she was kind of pursuing what was a, a, a phrase that had been used since the 1950s, this idea of a property-owning democracy, which was this conservative kind of ambition, the kind of dream of where everyone owns their own home. Um, and she went about this, there was a number of key changes, um, which I'll just touch on. So the first one was right to buy, um, which began, I think it was 1980. Um, and this was basically where people were given the right to buy their council houses at a steep discount compared to the market rate. And that was a, a kind of a huge amount of public money was put towards that subsidy, that sort of transfer of, of an asset from the public sector to, uh, over to the private sector. Um, and what's interesting about um, right to buy is this really had a transformative effect on the kind of mindset that people have. Um, and it led, so it led to a significant increase in owner occupancy in the 1980s and 1990s, and a, a kind of flip side to that is a steep decline in, social, in council housing. Uh, and obviously you had housing associations come in and play a small role, but not, not quite on the same extent. 
Um, what's interesting, though, it was deliberately designed by the Tories as, as a way of basically eroding uh, what they describe as socialist sentiment among people. And by giving people a stake in this idea, the system of private property, and by giving people a stake in private property and access to an asset, an appreciating asset, and the accumulation of unearned wealth, um, this was really seen as a way of kind of shifting the mindset of people away from this sort of collective mind of social housing towards uh, a more mindset orientated around properties, markets, and wealth. Uh, and it's interesting some of the discussion that you see from some of the key figures at that point, kind of explicitly recognizing this, that it will mean that less people will vote Labour and more people will vote Tory effectively was, uh, was what they were talking about. Um, and it allowed the, it meant that the ideology of the, the, the kind of individualism, um, property and markets to kind of take root in communities all around the country where prior to that it hadn't really taken root. People didn't really have a stake in this system of private property and wealth uh, before that. So it was a really, really, really powerful policy um, that had a really kind of clever bit of social engineering, if you like, which has really played a, a much more transformative role than I think a lot of the other changes that were made at, at that time. Um, and interestingly, this wasn't, again, this wasn't the result of kind of free markets just sort of like naturally doing that. This is an explicit state intervention uh, designed specifically to do that with public money thrown at it because it's quite an expensive policy because you're subsidising the sale of assets. The second one, uh, the big change, was just uh, the approach to house building. So as I said earlier, um, for much of the post-war history, most or a good chunk of the houses that were built were built by the government um, through large-scale uh, house building programmes. Um, after Thatcher came in, that was completely rolled back, and the decision was made that uh, house building should be left to the market. Government shouldn't be doing this. It should be something that, that the private sector does. And you can see here, um, so the, the big shaded grey area here at the very top, that is the amount of houses that are being built by local authorities. And you can see that huge numbers of homes built up until the early 80s, where it basically just stopped. Um, uh, and you can see as well that the, the amount of houses built in the private sector, the dark shade, just hasn't changed at all. And it's little wonder, you know, we have a housing, we have a housing crisis. Um, but basically, for a whole number of reasons, which, which we won't go into, but the private, private sector is not able to, doesn't have the incentives to actually build houses on the scale to meet the needs of society. Um, so this was another key change. And instead of sort of paying, instead of funneling money into building things, bricks and mortar, there was a conscious shift to instead basically subsidise individuals. So now we pay about 25 billion a year on housing benefit. Um, so instead of building houses, we, we let the market fail to do it. And then we subsidise landlords through housing benefit, because it just goes straight into the pocket of landlords. Um, but that was a conscious choice to this move away from this collective housing provision to what was called kind of subsidised individualism of, of the housing benefit model. Uh, and lastly, um, this is a bit of an ugly chart, but uh, it was, it's to do with the, what I was talking about, about financial deregulation. So prior to the 1970s, uh, as I said, there were strict controls on the financial sector, but particularly on mortgage lending. Um, and actually, um, most mortgage lending was done, well, in fact, a large majority was done by building societies, which were kind of small C conservative organizations owned by their members. And there were very strict rules about how much they could lend on credit creation. Um, but then after the finance was deregulated, as they begin the 1970s, particularly the 1980s, um, banks were incentivized to get into the mortgage lending market. And there was this explosion in credit. Um, and this chart just shows, uh, so this is credit relative to GDP. And basically, you just need to look at the green line here, uh, which, is, which is mortgage credit. And you can see just this massive increase beginning in the 1980s. Uh, and what you basically had was this ever-increasing supply of credit interacting with a relatively fixed supply of housing and land, which kind of fueled this housing boom. Um, and people found, obviously, that they had to take out ever larger mortgages to get on the housing ladder, a kind of a feedback loop between mortgage lending, house prices, and ever-increasing levels of household debt uh, emerged. Um, and the era of the housing boom uh, and, and bust, of course, was, was born. Um, uh, and this, this, this sort of process, uh, we've, got a, we've got a chart, I won't go into this too much detail, but this kind of feedback loop, essentially, between the financial system and, and housing, and this idea of the normalization of double-digit house price growth, um, combined with just an expectation that people all of a sudden think house prices are just going to keep going up, 
kind of changed the view of houses towards financial assets. So as 50 years ago, houses were mainly seen as basically places to live. Um, now they're seen as means of accumulating wealth and long-term security, particularly in the face in an age of stagnating wages and dwindling pensions. So it's this kind of rat race that you kind of need to get on the housing ladder because if you don't, then you're going to lose out. Um, and that's the kind of system that, 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 that's, that's in place today. And this is kind of driving a wedge through society because obviously for those who own property, this is great because increasing the house prices makes you wealthier. It means you've got greater economic security. It also means that you can then go and borrow more, maybe to buy another house or a second one. Whereas if you don't own property, this sort of cycle just means you've got higher rents in the rental market and having to save more for a deposit uh, for a mortgage, which means you've got less money left over. So this, this kind of is really driving uh, a wedge through society. Um, but it's also causing problems for lots of other sectors, this kind of financialization of housing and property, including the charity sector, the arts, and all kinds of uh, this, this increasing financial constraint through property. It's causing all sorts of issues. Um, so yeah, so I just thought I'd touch to kind of zoom in on, on how this has played out in one particular sector, because it kind of has all the hallmarks of, you've got the privatization the, through the state acting, and then you've got uh, leave things to the market, which has failed, which is the house building, and then you've got the deregulation here. It's all the kind of hallmarks of the kind of neoliberal approach to the model and, and how much of a failure that it's been. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I just thought I'd end briefly on, uh, I guess, looking forward, uh, because it's, it's, it's easy to be a bit down and just sort of complain about things. Um, so I do think, just to start with the big picture, that the kind of triumph of this model does, to a degree, in my view at least, reflect a bit of a failure in recent years on uh, sort of progressive-minded people to actually sort of credibly articulate an, an alternative, uh, particularly after the financial crisis, because after the, for example, the Depression in the 1930s when the kind of laissez-faire model failed, you had sort of Keynes come along and with a different kind of model and that, and that kind of worked for a bit. Then when that ran into trouble in the 1970s, the, the neoliberals came along and said, well, we've got, you know, we'll do this. And when neoliberalism had its cr major crash crisis point in 2008 with the financial crisis, it was kind of, you know, there was nothing, you know, there was not really, we kind of failed collectively to do anything about it. And since then, well, we've seen almost an intensification of that model rather than anything uh, different. So certainly a lot of the work that we do at NEF uh, is, is perhaps ambitiously trying to kind of work on a, a credible alternative to that. Um, but obviously that's a bit of a long-term game. Um, so I wanted to touch on something that's a bit more practical for particularly here in Scotland, which I think is, is really exciting time actually. Um, does anyone recognise this? Yeah, who said egg? Egg. It's egg, again, according to Google, uh, not me. Um, but some of you, you may have heard about the, the community right to buy stuff, which has been going on in Scotland for quite a long time, and egg's kind of a famous example of this, where it bought out, the community bought out the land that was previously owned by uh, some sort of absentee ar aristocrat, I think. Um, and through the creation of the Scottish Parliament and the land reform legislation you've had, the opportunity now uh, where communities helped with public funds can buy out land and sort of run it in the interest of the community. And in Egg, it's been lots of, quite transformational. You've had lots of interest in things like renewable energy. You've had a revival in the population. There's lots of good stuff going on. Up until recently, though, this has mainly been confined to kind of rural uh, Scotland, so particularly up in the northwest, the kind of islands. Um, Whereas recently there's been changes, uh, the, I think it's the Com Community Empowerment Act 2015, which means that the community buyout model uh, can now be done in urban contexts as well, in, uh, in towns and cities. Um, and that is supported by government money. So it's not that much, I think it's about £10 million a year in the Scottish Land Fund, which basically means that if you're a community, you can get funding to basically buy up uh, assets, <coughs> urban assets, uh, to be used and run in the interests of... Uh, communities. Um, and I think that this has really untapped potential in the urban context um, where uh, if there is, and there's talk now of legislating as well for compulsory purchase orders, which would be where basically if there is land which is derelict, not being used, or empty buildings, that they'd be forced to actually auction them off um, and potentially bought up by the community with public funds to be used and run in the interests of the community. And I think that this real opportunity to kind of reclaim urban spaces with the collective sphere and run in the community interest and kind of rebuild this sense of social solidarity which has kind of been eroded so much over the past 
decades. And crucially, it has the support of the state. We were talking earlier about this is it state or community thing. And this really gets both right, where you need the state to act to legislate and get the public funding. But then you have a community-led model where it's actually the community that are in the driving seat and doing it in the interest of the community. And I kind of see, hopefully, if this can grow, and it'll, it'll be interesting to see how it happens, because I don't think it's, this is just really recent where you can do it in an urban context. So this could maybe be a bit of a sort of a pushback against the kind of right to buy, uh, sell-off, and the kind of erosion of the social space uh, in our towns and cities. So I'm quite optimistic about this. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I'm, I'd be interested to, to get anyone's thoughts. If anyone knows more about it than me, maybe prob probably some of you do. Um, but I thought that'd maybe be a nice optimistic note to end on, uh, given that we're given that we're here. Thanks very much. Yeah, one of the interesting things uh, that we've been doing a bit of work on um, is, uh, so the councils in the, in the uh, UK are rapidly selling land uh, that they have. They're kind of, and that's partly to do with budget constraints through austerity, where they're basically being forced to try and raise as much money as possible, which, um, so we're trying to put across a message. If we have land in, in public hands, rather than sell it off to the highest bidder who's probably going to either sit on it and do nothing and wait for our values to rise, or uh, certainly in the case of down in parts of England, build housing that no reasonable person is ever going to be able to afford, you know, to do something more useful where it's going to benefit, uh, benefit the, the, the community. So that's certainly something that um, I think is important, is to make use of the public spaces that we've already got, um, as well as the opportunity where there's space owned privately that it's just being wasted, like derelict land, vacant land, uh, that's just been land banked that this through the community right to buy to actually you know take that with government help into the into community ownership um. I just read this uh, one thing yesterday it's kind of a bit related to it about um, that there are kind of castles and mansions being um, sort of lent out to communities of proposals in Italy to people I encourage particularly like art related source related kind of communities to propose something to do for that their site and then I think the government will like give us some funding but that also would attract tourism to the site in Italy because like a lot of sites are kind of not that populated obviously it's not that kind of not touristy to attract so it's kind of like encourages these this economy but also gives an opportunity to communities to do something for that on the site mm. and obviously that's yeah. It's not quite easy to access information. Like, you know, it's about 10 million. Yeah. The, I, I mean, uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not that familiar with the actual process, but it's the Scottish Land Fund, basically. And I think they've got 10 million pounds a year until 2020 guaranteed. And that's to help both urban and rural communities do community buyouts. And there's a lot of information online, and you think you have to sort of express an interest first. Um, 
But I think one of the most one of the more transformational bits that I don't think is in place yet. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but apparently it's going to be legislated on. Is this compulsory purchase order, which is where, because at the moment it's only if the land comes up for sale that the community has the first dibs on it. Whereas with this compulsory purchase order, it, it, it's if there is just land that is just being wasted, that there's a compulsion on the owner to put it up for auction because it's not being used in the public interest. And that would really be a game changer, I think, uh, certainly in the urban context where there is just so much kind of wasted land uh, or, or not being used. I think we have two questions. Uh, we'll take those first. Thanks. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on the use of the planning system. Is it supposed to be a kind of public system that helps us to design and plan our communities, you know, with enough spaces for art and enough spaces for education and uh, leisure and uh, all these different things together, but it uh, doesn't seem to do that particularly well. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, the planning, I think the planning s system lacks uh, a strategic oversight, a strategic approach, because like you say, uh, you should be manning it in a sort of, uh, uh, a, in a way that is looking at looking at the whole community, if you'd like. But there seems to be, from my experience, speaking to someone recently, who's a planner down south, where you have decisions made on a very short-term basis, responding to short-term pressures, uh, you know, over here and over here and over here, rather than taking a holistic approach, which says, with a long-term vision, as to how how do we want things to develop over the course of the next 10, 20 years. Um, so yeah, I, I think the planning I think the planning system is absolutely key uh, key to this, and we talk a little bit about it in the in the book. Um, uh, the, the other thing that's important here, actually, which I'll maybe just delve into maybe quickly, um, is this issue around land uh, in particular, and when planning permission is granted or when infrastructure is going to get built. Obviously, there's a mass of the land suddenly skyrockets in value because suddenly it's got planning permission or um, and at the moment in the UK, the rules have been in place for the past sort of, 40 years means that the landowner is entitled to that uplift effectively through the Land Compensation Act, I think it was 1961. Um, whereas previously in, in the UK, so if we look at things like the new towns that were built, the model that that was done by was really effective where the government or the corporations, the government corporations that were established, bought the land at basically agricultural value, built the houses and the infrastructure, got the uplift in the value of land and then sold the houses and then used that to pay off the finance. So it was kind of self-financing. Whereas that basically, uh, that model was kind of ended uh, in the 60s, which has put a whole, which is a massive pressure on development of housing and infrastructure because uh, if the landowner is entitled to that uplift, it just puts the, increases the cost of any kind of development and it's really choked off a lot of development. And they do it very differently in places like East Asia and, and um, uh, continental Europe as well. And interestingly, I thought I'd never say this, but uh, in the Tory manifesto this time, they've actually proposed to change this, uh, which is the one kind of positive thing in the Tory manifesto. They've actually highlighted this problem and proposed to change it, which I thought was really interesting, which I think is partly thanks to um, repeated efforts over many years from some of my friends at Shelter, the charity. So it's good to see. Yeah, that's a big challenge. That's a huge challenge, and I think uh, part of the risk, um, the, or the, the challenge, is that what, when this actually happens, you don't, a few years down the line, basically come under financial pressure where you end up sort of becoming a victim of market forces yourself and end up having to, to do something different. So yeah, no, I, I think that's a big challenge, and I think that, I mean, personally, my view is that there's always got to be uh, 
there is an important role of, of the of the government in, in sustaining this because um, you know if you have communities themselves trying to manage trying to manage this then you know they will get they will get, become the victim of, of, of market forces unless there's something there to to, to help help against that um, and I mean unless yeah I mean unless there can there can be some kind of way of, of of raising some kind of revenues to, to to help with maintenance and stuff like that, but yeah, I, I think reality, the long in terms of a long term thing, I don't think this is something where the government can just sort of get involved quickly and then disappear. I think there's got to be a commitment to to, to sustain it. I think. So I was wondering as well if it's, um, I guess, with the arts as well, um, when things are not that popular or they're not very, uh, or they're not financially sustainable, how can the community run? The space, um, because one of the things I was thinking about to me as well, you know, would would an art gallery gain as much uh, support from the local community as the library did, which I somehow doubt. Um, so there there would there would be places which you cannot necessarily finance or self finance. Yep. Which is a bit, you know, yeah, I, I think on a, an issue, I guess, uh, people like, uh, I do think a part of the problem is people like me, the economists, basically, who, over the years, there's been this drive towards a sort of increasing economisation of everything, and everything has to pan it past this monetary cost-benefit stuff, and it's just sort of driven this very, very narrow sense of what, what value, what's valuable and what's not, is this, like, very narrow monetary value um, as practiced by economists, and I think it's a real problem. Because I think if you look throughout history, there's lots of great things done, and with hindsight, I look and I think that would never have passed a modern economist cost-benefit uh, analysis, just because it's a very, very narrow approach. Um, so I'm very, I, I'm very critical of the, the way that uh, these types of things are done, and particularly within the government now, stuffed full of economists who, who are just, uh, who will do cost-benefit analysis and will say things are valuable or not valuable based on a very, very narrow set of criteria, um, which is why we've ended up with things just getting, you know, sold off or, or left to limbs in the market. So blame the economists, basically, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say, yeah. Is the time for one more? Yeah, sure. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Just, uh, just within what you were talking about there, um, there's, there, there's a Scottish thinker, uh, he's many different things, he also calls himself a, a spiritual activist called Alistair Mackintosh, and he was really um, instrumental in like the, the, the buy of, from the community of the Isle of Egg, but he's written extensively on how we need to almost relearn how to be a community. Um, there's a, a very interesting book called Rekindling Community that sort of came out of his experiences of working with the, the local community on Isle of Egg. Um, and there is sort of a huge place for art and culture within that. But if you're looking carefully on, on, on what the observations there um, is, um, you know, there's a real big rethink of what is art, what is culture, who is it for, who is it serving? Um, and it kind of traces roots like back about 200 years and further, where these things might be sort of more integrated in communities mm. and not isolated in, in sort of galleries, commercial galleries, and sort of, yeah. yeah. So it's sort of, it's this, I think there's something to be said about relearning how to be a community again yeah. um, with culture <laughs> as, a, as a kind of glue. That holds people together. Yeah, yeah I agree. Interesting. That's it then. Thank you very much.